All right, welcome everyone. Uh, we are here as our A to Z Impacts of Plastic Labor Solidarity event. And we are so excited um, for this, this event. And at A to Z, we, when you're here, your family, and we'd like to say thank you to our sponsors. Um, my slides are, not, are acting kind of slow here. Oh, there we go. So here are, whoops, now they're going too fast. There we go. <laughs> um, so thank you to our co-sponsors of the A to Z digital series. Let us know if you want to co-sponsor by posting in the chat. So co-sponsoring, just um, we just ask you to share out our events and um, support the work that we're doing um, through lifting up the, the voices of, of the different people we have on our, on our events. So, and now I'll turn it over to Kelsey. Yeah, it sounds good. Um, so at A to Z, we try to um, celebrate work in the movement in any way that we can. We love to incorporate music and the arts. Um, so we thought we'd kick things off with a little sing-along. Um, I'm going to lead us here. I am not a singer. Um, and so because singing along on Zoom doesn't always go so well with different people's internet speeds, I want to see all of your mouths moving and I want to see you singing along, but you can leave your mic on mute so it doesn't get too confusing. We're going to sing Solidarity Forever, which is a tune written by Ralph Chaplin. The IWW song. Um, it's to the tune of, um, what is it, when the saints go marching in? Um, so if we're one, a two, a one, two, three. Solidarity forever. Solidarity forever. Solidarity forever. For the union makes us strong. When the union's inspiration through the workers' blood shall run, there can be no power greater anywhere beneath the sun. Yet what force on earth is greater than the feeble strength of one? But the union makes us strong. Solidarity forever. Solidarity forever, solidarity forever, for the union makes us strong. <laughs> Yay, thank you everyone. I know that was rough, but it's a fun, it's a fun thing to do. <laughs> Okay, and now, um, so we'll, we'll kick things over to BJ. Um, she's gonna give us a land acknowledgement and just do a little bit more to orient us as we go into our program this evening. Thank you, Kelsey, that was a lot of fun. You know, something new. Um, and thank you, Mary and everyone. Um, the introduction and the caring and the deep de dedication to our future and for the next set of generations is always appreciated from here. And so I'm thanking the amazing producers for tonight's event. This is the sixth event. I couldn't believe it. I was like in my head, I was like, one, two, three. really? Because in and in of itself, it's kind of amazing, right? And it's a testament to the general commitment to all of us wanting to create equity and balance and healing and just grounding and abundance, you know, for the future generations. I'm BJ McManama. I live here in North Central West Virginia for about 31, 32 years altogether. My children's father was a coal miner. So I understand all of that and, and really appreciate the union. Um, how the union took care of us for a long time, how the union brought us together as a family. Not that we were, <laughs> not, not that we were happy about what we were doing, but we were grateful for being able to provide for our families. So the union for a long time was good. And 
there are some things that aren't so good. And I hope when we, when we rebuild this labor movement that we remember what wasn't good and build on the best. So now I go into um, why I was here. Um, I'd like to welcome everybody this evening with gratitude and an open heart. I'm here as a descendant of the Seneca peoples, as, a, um, as someone who loves this land. I'm an uh, organizer with the Indigenous Environmental Network. I've been with them for 17 years on and off, um, mostly on, um, wearing many different hats. Um, and as I said, I'm a descendant, descendant of the Seneca peoples who were the keepers of the Western door and their territory and some of the people lived this far down. And, um, you know, I found evidence of that a while back. Um, and I'd like to remind everyone, wherever you're at, to think about the peoples that were there, where you are. Where I am now was the Seneca, the Shawnee, the Lenni Lenape, the Cherokee, um, and the Mingo tribe. Uh, and there were many more that will probably never know their names. So before the invaders came, our lands were pristine. Our lands were pristine across this land. It was said that a squirrel could climb a tree in what is Manhattan now and its little feet wouldn't hit the ground until they reached the Mississippi River. You know, we could, before the invaders, we could eat and be healed by the nutritious gifts that Creator gave to us until we we're invaded by people who had already fouled their lands, their water, they cut down all their forests and the haves and have nots were at constant war. Um, and it kind of sounds familiar, right? Different time, different place, but the same results from people who depend on an extractive economy. Today, this evening, we're here to continue the processes of healing that we have started, the processes of sharing the knowledge from the people tonight. I'm really looking forward to hearing them because we need to know what's going on. And I'm assuming most people here tonight with us either want to know more or they know more and they can share with us what they know um, so that we can rebuild, so that we can repair because this extractive economy that we are fighting is violent. Sorry. <laughs> I'm just thinking about the violence that we are perpetrating against one another, all of the, all of the death and the dying and the, and the hatred that we have for one another. And at least for the thousand, fifteen hundred years before the invaders came, we had learned how to live together. We had learned how to share this land. We had learned how to live well and in peace. So they say history repeats itself, right? And we didn't, if we don't learn from it, and I don't think we've learned from it. We've abandoned the lessons. We've ignored our original instructions. And one thing I like to remind people that we're all indigenous at some point in our history, our ancestors. It doesn't matter where you came from. There were indigenous people across this world and everyone had their own ways of being within their creation. So where you're standing right now is important because someone loved that land and someone cared for that land. But it's not all lost, right? We're here. We're, 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 we're close. You know, we, we haven't been given that many years to, you know, straighten our act up, right? Um, and it doesn't mean if we, if we look to history for the lessons, for the things that we need, to the solutions that we need, it doesn't mean we're going to be living in the dark ages, right? But I can guarantee you one thing, if we don't change, there will be dark ages because everything around us will be dead and dying and dangerous and we'll be living in a worldwide resource colony. Because extraction is violent, it scarred our homelands and it sickened everything and everywhere as the invaders, and I still call them the invaders because they serve, um, they serve money, they say they're greedy and everything they, everything they touch, they want to bend to their own 
needs or their own wants, more wants instead of needs. So it's up us to up, it's up to us to relearn our original instructions and pay attention and learn our place within this great creation wherever you are, not just for us, but for our children and all of the generations to come. And so we come together tonight to support our relatives in the work that they do too, to stand in solidarity for them to be treated with respect and compensated in order to live a quality life. I call your attention to the history of the labor movement here, the United Mine Workers, the warriors of Blair Mountain and the Rednecks, their bravery and tenacity brought temporary rights, workers' rights that uplifted thousands out of abject po poverty and despair. We need to look to the ways of the past, take what we need, emulate what, what worked, find ways to integrate the ways of a frugal and sustainable life into our own mindsets and actions. We need to look to those with genuine indigenous traditional knowledge, to the lessons of my ancestors learned and saved for us that was given by Peacemaker. Peacemaker came to us. We weren't being good. <laughs> we needed Peacemaker. We were being very bad. We were being very bad to everyone. And we were committing the same kind of violence to our relatives, to our family, to our lands. And, you know, violence reigned and it took Peacemaker and generations of faith and wisdom keepers to give us the map, the instructions, the ways. We have people who have knowledge and genuine desire and dedicate dedication to what we need to know now, right now, tonight. We have six people that are going to be sharing with you and I'm looking forward to that. They'll tell us how to stop it maybe. It, the more we know, the more we can do, right? So again, look around you, where you live, pay attention to the beauty that remains. And tonight, please share the native lands that you occupy now, where you're from and plot your location. And I have a link here that I will share as soon as I wrap this up so everybody can do it. Um, I also want to remind people that um, tonight we're here with our Ohio Valley Environmental Coalition brothers and sisters, and I want everyone, if you, if you can, please send some good energy, some good vibes, and now I am going to turn it over to the next person, and I didn't really listen during. That would her. be me. <laughs> Beatrix, thank That's you so fine. much. That so was fine. just absolutely wonderful. You always do such a good job with the opening. Uh, hi, I'm Peggy Berry, and I will be your moderator tonight for the discussion. And I'm a registered nurse, <coughs> a member of the Alliance of Nurses for Healthy Environments. And uh, I have a PhD, as well as being a certified occupational health nurse. I've been involved with many environmental efforts since 2012, after finding out that fracking solution chemicals were being hidden under proprietary rules, and the material data, data safety sheets were not readily available for emergency responders or ER staff treating any exposures. Uh, so that's my passion. That's why I'm here. And each speaker will introduce themselves to the group. Justin, why don't we start with you and then you name your next speaker. Okay, yeah, my name is Justin Noble. I'm a science and environmental journalist um, speaking tonight from Mohican land. And I've spent the past three years reporting on um, a really specific, seemingly obscure issue, but it's actually something with really long tentacles and it touches uh, all of us really. And that's the radioactivity brought to the surface in oil and gas production and the many different pathways of contamination posed to the industry's workers, the public and communities and the environment. Um, and I've traveled a lot across this land in this work and um, spoken to a lot of workers. Uh, one of them was actually uh, really happy to say on the call tonight as well. Um, but I've learned that folks are, are being put into jobs where they face tremendous risks uh, and they're improperly protected um, and also improperly 
uh, informed about these risks. And, and in the worst case, you know, people without PPE, without knowledge of what they're facing, sent into tanks with nothing but a shovel and a squeegee um, to clean out what really is radioactive sludge. Um, and it gets mm -hmm. on their body, on their clothes, which might be washed at home with their children's clothes. Um, and it's really, um, you know, I, I appreciate the, the tone that, that you all have on, on violence and on, on the history of how a situation comes to be, because um, I think it's hard to look at this situation. It's so shocking. Um, and we've become numb to like what is really happening. And, 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 it's, and it's really a trauma, um, you know, that we're putting people in front of. Um, and, and they're literally, um, you know, getting smothered with something toxic. Uh, and yet it's, you know, couched in something very bureaucratic, something um, that we call like an exemption. And so really, I think the oil and gas industry workers and, and many different types of them are, are the, the human um, wound of, of these exemptions that we've created for this industry. And we talk a lot about the exemptions and the buys they get, but, um, you know, my work is focused a lot on, on how it actually hits and cuts into the human um, flesh. So i um, will be talking more about that tonight, but I really appreciate the group, all of you. And, and yeah, thank you so much for including me. Thank you so much. Erica Jackson, can you say a little bit about yourself? Yeah. Um, hi, everyone. My name is Erica Jackson. I'm the manager of Community Outreach and Support at Crack Tracker Alliance, uh, where my work focuses on providing maps and data to communities impacted by oil and gas development. Um, my work mainly focuses on the Ohio River region, but also other areas, other parts of the country impacted by fossil fuels. Um, I'm currently in Pittsburgh, ancestral Osage land, but I'm originally from Columbus, Ohio, um, ancestral lands of Shawnee, Cherokee, Delaware, Miami, Wyandotte, Ojibwe people. Um, like a lot of the panelists shared before everyone hopped on, um, my family were Appalachian settlers who immigrated to the U.S. Um, I found work in the coal industry of Eastern Ohio, um, like the Steubenville area. Um, before this work, I was doing research at the University of Pittsburgh on air pollution and doing a lot of mapping, um, looking at the county I'm in, Allegheny County, and uh, air pollution sources, which then kind of morphed into looking at air pollution from fracking. Um, but through that work, I really gained an appreciation for mapping and uh, not just as tools for research, but for the political power they have. You know, we all started this call with the ancestral lands map. Um, you know, the, the person who has the, the power to draw those borders in is really powerful. So that's kind of how I ended up at Frack Tracker, um, where I get to spent a lot of time mapping and that was kind of also frack trackers entry point um, into the falcon pipeline um, was through a discovery of a ton of mapping data um, which i'll be talking about a little bit later today thank you so very much uh chrissy stonebreaker martinez did i say that right Please martinez yeah martinez hi everyone i'm chrissy stonebreaker martinez um, I come to you uh, from the near west side of Cleveland right now. Uh, my political and spiritual home is at the Interreligious Task Force on Central America and Colombia. I am a native South American um, of Embedda descent from what is currently known as Colombia, as well as a descendant of Appalachian settlers. I'm also the I'm also queer and disabled, and I'm the child of a steel worker, um, and have had many farm workers in my lineage before the industrial revolution. Uh, the The majority of my work is as a as a water and land protector is um, done in accompaniment uh, internationally, and I participate in. 
um, unarmed civilian protection, calling on calling out the UN for their reliance on militarized forces to quote unquote keep peace. Uh, and I um, accompany folks who are environmental protectors, oftentimes Afro descendant and indigenous folks whose uh, family members have been assassinated or whose um, who have been receiving death threats for their um, for their defense. And in particular, right now I have a, a campaign uh, for water equity, international water equity going on that I'll drop in the chat um, that is in support of eight political prisoners in Honduras. Um, they're called the Guapinol resistors. And I'm excited to share more with you all and be in circle with you tonight. Thank you so much. Uh, Jesse Lombardi, please introduce yourself. Good afternoon, everybody. I'm Jesse Lombardi. I am the former director of operations for an oil field company here located in Bridgeport, Ohio, but I was the national director of operations for all our organizations. I moved on to another company, local in Steubenville and Wintersville area, was their operations manager. I know the ins and outs, I've created the SOPs. I know how to evade. I know all the illicit things that the oil and gas industry does. I had a change of heart uh, about two or three years ago when I inherited my family's homestead and really got in touch with my roots. Started living off the land, fending for my family, uh, really appreciating nature. I've been fortunate to get in touch with the people, Frag Tracker, Jill, Yuri, Justin, everyone that has shown me the light in the right way and that there's actually someone out there fighting the good fight. And I figured, well, with all my knowledge and all the red in my ledger, let's go ahead and wipe some of that out and get behind the people fighting the good fight and let's, let's go at it. So that is me. And I am here from the Belair, uh, St. Clairsville area. I overlooked uh, 470 to my left and Route 7 uh, east of me. Thank you very much. Daryl uh, Wiley, you're here. Tell us more about you. Yeah, <clears throat> my name's Daryl Malik Wiley. I'm a <clears throat> excuse me, environmental justice organizer with the Sierra Club, a proud member of the Progressive Workers Union which represents Sierra Club staff and other nonprofits. Um, I was fired from a job in my, in the, uh, in, early in my career because I talked with guys at a plant, a Hercules chemical plant. And the question I was asking was, we're working in New or North Carolina for 10, 15 hour in New Jersey, they're getting paid 20 50 an hour. What's going on? We're doing, and actually we're producing more than they're producing. So uh, I got fired officially for being outside my work area. Um, and it didn't end there. I got hired at a, I moved to Alabama, got hired by Spun Steel, which used to have its plant up in the Canton Akron area, but moved south to get away from labor unions and was um, on strike for a year and they decertified union. So I know what it's like both sides of the coin. I also worked with the Oil Chemical Atomic Workers Union during the BASF lockout in Louisiana that went on for five and a half years. And that's where a union organizer, uh, Richard Miller and myself uh, coined the term Cancer Alley and we've uh, continued to use that to talk about what's happening here in New Orleans, uh, Louisiana, which is uh, Homa and Chickamauga land. Uh, so that's a little bit about me. Thank you so much. So I'm gonna start out this panel discussion with just a, a little um, bit of information prior to the question. Uh, I come from a strong union family, just like BJ, uh, but this is out of St. Louis, the Carpenters Credit Union. Without a union, my father would not have had health insurance for his family, workers' compensation for his injuries, or vacation time as a contractor. He was a union official, and he believed everybody's right to work and to be treated fairly. 
Labor solidarity is important, whether working in a warehouse, as with Amazon, with their unionization attempt in Bessemer, Alabama, or with the Ohio Valley Environmental Coalition, uh, who, who are now becoming members of the Industrial Workers of the World. OVAC members are negotiating for standardized pay scales, equitable disciplinary policy, and the right to union representation uh, at any meeting that affects their staff pay, hours, benefits, advancements, or layoffs. We stand in solidarity with the staff of the Ohio Environment, uh, the Ohio Valley Environmental uh, Coalition. So to our panelists, how has your experiences shown the need for labor solidarity? Um, I will let uh, anybody go first. Uh, Daryl? Yeah, I think that, you know, while I was working with the Oil Chemical Atomic Workers Union on the BAS lockout, they came to us, environmental movement, because they were trying to figure out different handle to get leverage on getting back their jobs. So they brought out a, a map of the plant and they had all the workers locate where they dump stuff on the plant. And then they went to the state environmental agency and say, we want enforcement. We know it's there. The company didn't report it. We put it there. And it sort of built a relationship that uh, we've been working with them ever since on different projects. And it it's working with labor unions is just working with anybody else. We're all the same. We all have the same desires, needs, wants. And too many times the boss the company, the corporations try to drive wedges between us that were different. You know, I'm a green, I'm a blue, you know, it's all smoke and mirrors to stop us getting strong. Oh, uh, appears that he has uh, frozen. Chrissy, can you uh, continue that uh, thought process? You want to restate that question? Uh, certainly. Um, how has your experiences shown the need for labor solidarity? Sorry, Daryl, you froze. Daryl, did Let's you see. have anything to add really quick? No, I was I was done. I'm sorry. Oh. I should have <clears throat> should have said that. Okay. Um, well, first I would say the, the easiest way for me to answer that question is. Um, in my, as an organizer, in my training over many years and just mostly through observation, uh, it has become very clear to me that it's important to organize within already organized communities, right? We need, um, if we're going to have a true democracy, we need, uh, if we're going to have a participatory and representative democracy, we need that to be um, part of our labor as well. Right? We spend the most amount of our time um, in our lives contributing to offering our labor, offering um, work. Uh, and so it's important, I think, to make sure that we're empowered and engaged in creating conditions um, and taking, taking self-responsibility, not only as an individual, but also as communities and as organizations to um, create better conditions for ourselves, right? To, to seize the means of production, if you will. Um, I think it's also really important uh, when we come together, we're able to understand different experiences. So I've found such, such inspiration working with the Poor People's Campaign uh, because they've intentionally chosen to organize within communities of faith, as well as within um, the labor movement, in addition to, um, you know, as a broad tent across, um, across uh, poor and working class uh, folks. In that, I've seen, you know, UFCW and SEIU and AFL-CIO and Unite Here and USW and UAW and all of these acronyms coming together 
and sharing tips and tricks, right? There's so much um, more that we, that we have to gain when we do work together. I also think it's really, the last thing I'll say for this specific question is, I think it's really, really important to not lose the rights that our ancestors have worked so, so, so hard to establish, right? I mentioned before, I'm the child of a steel worker. Um, I've had um, auto workers in my family and many, many other union uh, workers, but those are definitely the most prominent um, in my family and my family members, my father, you know, he, he taught me never to cross a picket line. He taught me what solidarity meant. He taught me um, what it meant to support um, the union and what, and what a 40 hour working week meant. And, you know, in 2021, um, as we're envisioning a, a world of automation, we deserve an even smaller working, working week, but until we get healthcare and education, we'll keep working. Um, we'll keep working for those very real immediate reliefs right now. But um, our ancestors taught us what it meant to rest, what it meant to honor and respect the land, something that was really hard for me in my accompaniment work in Colombia was accompanying mining communities, indigenous mining communities, and having to get out of my brain, you know, this, this impulse to say mining is bad. Yes, extraction is bad. And we currently do not have a society that um, would run without um, some extractive industries. We hope that we can get there one day. And that is the world because we're abolitionists and, and people who are focused on liberation. That is the world that we're working for. But until that day comes, wouldn't it be better if we had practices that didn't, um, that didn't, that weren't like mountaintop removal, that didn't destroy um, the place that we are getting our resources from that honors, you know, my indigenous um, uh, friends and family who participate in, in ancestral mining techniques in Colombia, you know, they know that um, the gold that comes from the mountain that they work on is what gives them their livelihood. And it is part of their culture and it is celebrated and honored and revered. And they also know that they can't do this work forever. And they work very hard to um, teach their family members what it means to be food sovereign and to grow. Um, but if we are going to have these extractive industries in our, in, um, you know, in the short term, in the immediate, we need to make sure that the people and the, and who have been charged with stewarding the lands that we're working on, that they get to determine what it is um, that, that they do with the wealth that comes from, from that land. Um, there are too many times where wealth is not only extracted from the land, it's also um, shipped to, right, these colonial powers. Um, and, and Canada and the U.S. and their mining companies are, are the worst offenders. So um, all of this, all of this um, is about us learning what it means to, to support and defend each other, learning what it means to have each other's back, learning that we are much, we have much, much more to gain when we work together. And, um, and I'll just say that we have so much to lose. We, we in, especially in Ohio, we're facing four anti-protest bills. And we know that that will um, primarily affect Afro-descendant people, indigenous people, environmental protectors, and, um, and uh, it will also certainly affect labor and people's ability to organize. And so we have so much commonality and, and so much common ground that we must um, take advantage of, of these moments that we have to build trust with each other and to take risks with each other. Oh. Wow, Chrissy, incredible. Uh, Jesse, I was going to ask you the similar question. How's your experience shown the need for labor solidarity? Labor, labor solidarity initially takes you from the ability of having a job to having 
in your hands the potential to have a career. That's two different words. People throw around the word job all the time and just say job, job, job. Nobody, whether you're poor, whether you're rich, middle class, nobody wants to jump from job to job to job. They want a career. That's part of the American dream. When you can have that peace of mind that you can go to work, put in a hard day's work, honest day's work, get equal pay as everyone else, whether it be in Alabama, Bessemer, Alabama, or up in North Dakota. When you're getting the same pay right across the board for the same type of work, then you're talking. That's, that's good. Then you're looking at the career. You get trained properly. You get to become multifaceted and you get protected. It's almost like having an oversight committee when you're formed, when you have solidarity. You don't have to worry about management or the man coming down on you and coming up with a new way to create a new thing to circumnavigate the rules and regulations that are in place. So forming a union or being part of a conglomerate or a group of people that say, look, this is the way things are going to be. This is the way that we're going to be trained. This is the PPE we need to be given. These are the safety protocols we need to abide by. These are the SOPs we need to be following. And then being able to voice their opinions out there and it going to someone then it's not falling on deaf ears. That's where it starts. Thank you. Thank you. Erica, um, how has your experiences shown the need for labor solidarity? Um, well, I would echo what's already been said and just add that in the oil and gas industry, well, um, and from the environmental community's perspective, we're always talking about the health impacts of, of the industry, but workers are really probably the most exposed um, to pollutants and toxins. So um, the environmental community, you know, can't be like um, just focus on, you know, residents living fence line and front line, but workers' health is also a, an important part of the conversation. Um, and they also have the best knowledge of what's happening um, on site. So with our work, looking at issues with the Falca pipeline, um, none of those problems would have been brought to light if it weren't for workers speaking out. And ultimately, especially if workers are working in the community where they live, um, they don't want to be you know, exposed to these problems either. Um, so there's a lot of opportunity and um, um, to, yeah, to work together around that. Um, we're always talking about, you know, throwing around the term just transition, but ultimately, um, you know, any, as we move to different ways of making energy, producing energy, if we're not um, creating sustainable jobs, uh, jobs that careers, as Jesse was saying, that people want and people can maintain and that protect their health, um, and if the, the workers transitioning aren't part of that conversation, then we haven't achieved the goal of, um, you know, a healthier future. Oh, thank you, Erica, very much. Uh, Justin, uh, what has your experience shown uh, for the need of labor solidarity? Yeah, absolutely. Um, really powerful things said by people. Um, thank you. And, um, to build off that, I, I think, you know, I, I'm a journalist. I am um, looking for people to convey information to me, knowledge, right? And um, and I can put it together with other knowledge and tell a story. And what I think is so astonishing is that we live in what we regard, um, you know, as this very modern time, uh, information can be created and passed and, and searched so easily, right? But yet still knowledge is, um, is used and blocked and, and, and shunted off in really dramatic ways. And um, an example, you know, involving Jesse who just spoke, um, an oil and gas worker is um, with something that I report on, which is this radioactivity. Um, it is brought to the surface in various ways in oil and gas production. And it's something that the industry is actually really well aware of. And so I'm just gonna hold up, I think this should work. Um, but this is a report 
very official looking called Managing Naturally Occurring Radioactive Material. The industry calls that norm in the oil and gas industry. And this is put out by the International Association of Oil and Gas Producers. So this is an international association. And a lot of the oil and gas industry, like the real early roots go back, um, or at least some of the most powerful companies um, to North Sea development. So this is Shell, this is um, BP and, and Shell's um, offices, by the way, and some of the authors of this report, um, Shell is Royal Dutch Shell. It's, they're in Amsterdam in a very fancy building overlooking you know, this um, affluent European city and they know what's happening. They know this report and when I showed this to Jesse in Ohio, this particular photo, um, Jesse had no idea. And, and many people that he connected to had no idea. And the photo should hopefully come through, but it's, it's a really um, simple graphic, but it's, a, it's an oil field worker opening up a pipe and there's radioactivity. There's radioactive sludge and scale that forms inside many pipelines um, and valves that workers end up cleaning. And if they're not told about that, they open that pipe and the diagram shows you literally, you are breathing in um, particles that are gonna be emitting radiation right into your lungs, right into your internal organs um, and parts of your body. Your skin might have the ability to block some of radiation, your internal organs don't. And this is, it's such a simple thing to inform people of. And yet um, I showed it to Jesse and his draw job. And he sent, uh, he sent the message on to his colleagues still in the industry, dozens of people. And, um, and he was getting calls immediately on his phone. Like, what is that? What is that photo? And you can find this photo on the internet if you look hard enough. Um, the, again, the top level in this industry knows this and still has um, not informed workers. And it's, it wouldn't even be that hard to get the right PPE to, to protect folks. So I think, um, you know, echoing what people have been saying, you know, building across, um, across different groups and, and sharing the knowledge. Um, and, and, the, and, you know, I'm in a lucky position, I think, because I get to talk to Jesse, I get to talk to community members, I get to talk to grassroots organizers, and, and I can do that. I, I can share that knowledge across. and. Um, but I think that's, you know, really where a lot of this begins. Um, wow. So Just incredible. Uh, before I uh, throw out the next couple of questions, I'm going to set the stage for you. To me, um, I, I'm, I'm a researcher, too. And I always look at definitions of the, the subjects I'm going to discuss. So uh, I went online today and the Merriam-Webster Dictionary describes a whistleblower as an employee who brings wrongdoing by the employer or by other employees to the intention of the government or law enforcement agency. Uh, to me, whistleblowers are heroes. They play a huge role in reporting the worst of corporate and government excesses, abuses, and wrongdoing. But being a hero is not without its psychological and financial impacts, even when doing the right thing. Um, adverse actions are taken against workers for exercising their rights to even a safe working environment. They can lose jobs, denied benefits, demoted, or even received threats or other forms of intimidation when they bring safety issues to light. Now, various uh, agencies do provide whistleblowing uh, protections. The EPA uh, has uh, whistleblowing in every one of their six environmental statutes. Uh, the OSHA Act protects worker safety and health and also their rights to file an OSHA complaint and to participate in the inspections or talk to inspections. So uh, given the, the health hazards that uh, Justin has talked about, and what we are seeing into the damage of the land or even with the uh, volatile organic compounds that are uh, released whenever we're doing fracking or in the manufacture of plastics. How have you seen whistleblower 
well, how, how have you seen or have you seen how whistleblowers protect workers and communities? Um, Chrissy, I'm going to start with you. How have I seen whistleblowers protect communities? Um, whew, I have, I'm not sure how to answer that question. Uh, from my perspective, whistleblowers have been very much persecuted um, for exposing um, the corruption of power and wealth hoarders. And um, they do that work um, at great personal risk to themselves or their organizations. Mm -hmm. uh, for instance, my international, thank you, Chris, my, my international um, water equity campaign started because Berta Cáceres, the 2015 Goldman Environmental Prize winner was murdered uh, 10 days after my um, collective member was accompanying her in Honduras on March 2nd of 2016. And I found out that Goldman Environmental Prize winners have a very, very, very high um, rate of assassination for their work um, because people are profiting off of not just labor exploitation, but also off of skirting environmental regulation. And um, people stand to lose a lot of wealth and capital when um, these things are exposed. Um, but I do think it's important if we want to win uh, that we need people who are willing to um, take these risks uh, in all of organizing, we need people who are working inside the system for reform to alleviate the boots off of our necks, but we also need people who are abolitionists, who are working outside of systems to create the generative, what Gandhi called constructive programming that we need um, to see a beloved community. And we also need people working against the systems um, simultaneously. We need all of those things. And without people willing to expose uh, what is happening in um, ivory towers and, and other um, places that are uh, gate kept uh, is, is part of our popular education, right? It's part mm -hmm. of how we become radicalized. It's part of how we become made conscious of um, the systems that are determining our destinies um, and it is part of how we start to understand how we can collectively determine our own destinies when we work together. Uh, and so I think that I have also seen, I've seen people get better um, at exposing this information um, as a collective, right? So that the, the risk isn't um, as great as when it's an individual. And, um, and I've seen sadly that there are people who are human rights defenders all over the world uh, that need to um, consider their privacy and their security uh, and the ways that they, um, that they engage with the um, surveillance society that we exist in uh, to get our work done. Wow. Um... I will tell you, I told a coworker that I was uh, going to be moderating this, and she says, boy, you're brave. And I went, well, oh, I didn't even consider that. Um, Jesse, uh, I'm going to go to you, because obviously you are, uh, to a certain extent, a whistleblower, and have had to deal with any kind of uh, retaliation that might have occurred with you trying to uh, um, move away from the extractive service. So I'm going to ask you those two questions. Have you seen how whistleblowers are protecting workers and communities? And despite whistleblower protections, and I'll tell you, I, I don't, I don't see uh, protection like in South America or Honduras. The, they are definitely um, at risk, but how are you dealing with any types of, of unjust 
retaliation? Well, I don't believe I'm a whistleblower. You know, I'm out of the out of the sector, so to say. I'm semi-retired at a young age. I want nothing to do with the oil and gas industry. I've been contacted by numerous companies to, you know, come be their ops manager or business development director of operations. I have no interest in doing it. It's wrong. I, I want nothing to do with it. The money's not, it's just not worth me bending my morals or have to tuck them in my top dresser drawer to go to work every day. Uh, how have I seen whistleblowers be protected or help people? You don't because, and I'm going to be brutally honest. That's one thing I am. I am. I am very brutally honest. People like myself, you know, I'm 5'10", 285, covered in tattoos. We're all intimidating people and designed to be intimidating. It's part of their tactics. You don't tell on anything. You've got a problem, you bring it to the company and we'll handle it. Uh, whether it be pad your pockets with more money or help cover it up. You know, I've been part of some, some things that I'd really rather not tell a hundred plus people, but uh, you know, I, I've spoken to Jill and Yuri and, and Ted about it and it's not good stuff that's going on. It's just very immoral stuff that's going on. Not, not just immoral, but illegal and immoral. And to say that someone is protected as a whistleblower is just, uh, I hate to say this, but nonsense because no one is protected as a whistleblower. And I wish there were more protections for them legally. You know, even in the police force, they have the blue wall. <laughs> you know, they, in the oil and gas industry, it's the same type of situation. You just don't speak out. And if there is a problem, it is handled internally. Every problem from workplace incidents, accidents, uh, any type of problem. I mean, I would fire 25 people a day at, at the high point uh, for the smallest infraction. And whenever they don't have their job, then they just go get another one and they forget all about that little problem they had. It's a very immoral industry that everyone is fighting against, including myself. And that's why it needs to be stopped or changed or be overseen by someone else to help no pun intended, clean it up. It, it is, it's disgusting. So there are no protections is, is my answer. And there in the whistleblower that would come out, uh, what they'll do from a corporate point of view, they will try to berate them, belittle them, make them seem like they've done something wrong, destroy their credibility, all kinds of things like that. I have no worries, no care, you know, sitting on 64 acres i can see anyone coming from any direction you know i protect my own <laughs> i don't worry about you know someone coming up here and saying hey wow. you uh you were standing against us i i know and i intend to because it's wrong and that's what you have to do you have to be able to take a step for, forward stand up on that podium and say this is wrong and i'm not backing down until something changes or until i can be bled like a bleat or like a beat and give out all my information it, it needs to happen and uh i'm here to do it i'm here to help wow okay uh daryl i'm i'm gonna ask you these two questions have you seen whistleblowers protecting workers and communities and despite the potential of workplace uh, workplace whistleblower protections, have you seen instances where they face unjust retaliation? Like Jesse was saying, most folks become whistleblowers. Uh, they lose their job. Then the company starts attacking them, their family, their history, their social life, uh, their sexuality, anything at all to. Uh, make it seem like the person is uh, off in the head, insane, couldn't have seen what was happening because we would never do anything like that. And uh, it's very tough. And um, with the uh, BASF example, there it was a number of workers uh, standing together in the union struggle saying, we did this. We know it's wrong. We want the state agency to force them to clean up. 
And that's what it takes is a strong union, strong support to have your back um, in these type of situations. And in the South, it's very hard for union organizing. I just lay it out there. You know, the, the what went on in uh, with the uh, Amazon at the Bessemer site, that's the standard operating procedure. You know, we tell every, you know, and we just have to hope that we get the uh, new bill through Congress that gives us workers back some of the protection they had if they want to organize a union and get uh, union protection for their jobs. Yeah, the PRO Act, that's what it is. Thank you, somebody put it in the chat. Thank you. Okay, um, I guess I'll ask Erica that same question before I go to Justin. Erica, uh, have you seen whistleblowers protecting workers and communities? And just the opposite, have you seen instances where whistleblowers have faced unjust retaliation? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so um, I think I was brought here today because to talk about the whistleblowers around the Falcon Pipeline. Um, the Falcon Pipeline is a really high profile project for Shell. It connects to um, an ethane cracker in Pennsylvania being constructed. And some pretty serious issues have come to light about the Falcon, including that it could have been built with defective coding and that workers have um, falsified records and reports that are required to self-report um, incidents that happened during construction. And those have only come to light because of whistleblowers uh, working on the pipeline that spoke out, went to FEMSA, um, and those, those allegations have been, um, well, I can't say for sure exactly what has been investigated and proven to happen and be true. Um, those allegations have gone up the highest uh, ranks of power in our federal government um, to the former secretary of the Department of Transportation, um, Elaine Chow. And um, yeah, all of that would have been covered up if it weren't for whistleblowers who came forward. And it's the same at the Shell site, uh, the Ethan Cracker construction site. I don't know if you can call, call them whistleblowers, but people have been workers on the site. There are thousands, 8,000 workers on the site. And they have multiple times gone to reporters to talk about the unsafe working conditions that put them at risk for COVID, um, many working without paid sick leave. Um, another reason why solidarity with workers is so important for community health, because if all the workers are contracting COVID, then, you know, so is the community. Um, and yeah, I'm not sure if those are technically whistleblowers, but they've been, they've been talking anonymously with reporters. And one thing that I've read about whistleblowers is that most, um, the vast majority report things internally first. It's like, like Jesse was saying, it's not an easy to decision to speak out or, you know, you put yourself at risk. Um, so it says a lot that there have been many whistleblowers involved with Shell's construction in Pennsylvania, Ohio, and West, West Virginia. And um, yeah, they're being retaliated against, I mean, that I, well, I guess I can't say that <laughs> with complete certainty, but um, evidence is there that it seems like they're being retaliated against. Um, their witnesses, according to the DEP, the Pennsylvania agency overseeing um, part of the pipeline's construction, witnesses have reported retaliatory firings by Shell of people coming forward. So it's not just losing this job, but then, you know, workers could be um, blacklisted or their reputations ruined somehow for other jobs or companies that are contracting with them. Um, so that's just one, you know, one example, but I've also remember reading reports around the Mariner East, another pipeline in Pennsylvania of geologists, um, a geologist whistleblower coming forward and saying they were being forced to 
falsify reports and crazy things like calling um, sinkholes like earth features and um, <laughs> sorry <laughs> it, another example of uh, you know the the dangers of self reporting. Wow, oh, awesome. Um, well, not awesome, but uh, thank you for that information. Uh, Justin, I know you have been looking into a lot of these issues uh, about the whistleblowers that are protecting workers and communities, but also the retaliation that may be occurring towards these people. Um, can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, I, I think um, I think Chrissy and and Jesse both bring up um, really clearly that that these threats are very real, um, and um, I mean really striking to hear Chrissy talk about people who are winning awards for their environmentalism, and then this is something you know that's come across my radar too. They are more likely to later be assassinated. I mean that is the reality of it. In um, this place that we are in, in the United States, we, we maybe are not facing um, assassination attempts in the same way, but, but Jesse lays out the, the, the risk that a worker faces and it's very real. And it, um, it's certainly a credibility assassination, a blacklist from the industry, from jobs, from feeding your family. Um, so it's a tremendous thing. Um, and just there, there is a there's an anecdote um, that I just was reminded of recently because this is happening right now, just of how difficult it is and what you may face, and and in turn like how much we have to respect someone who comes forward with information. But there's a human rights attorney, Stephen Donziger, um, right now. Uh, Chevron has this uh, in on trial with Chevron and backstory for those who don't know it Stephen Donziger went to Ecuador and um, and was a, an attorney for people in communities in um, in Amazonian Ecuador who were contaminated um, by Texaco and then Chevron brought Texaco by oil and gas waste that came up in their drilling operations. Um, and um, it's an incredible story of, of oil and gas waste, what I'm reporting on, contaminating local waterways, local communities, um, all sorts of cancer issues coming up. Um, and, and now Stephen Donziger, the human rights attorney, is on trial in New York in house arrest for, I think, about two years yeah. now. And Chevron has said that they will fight this case until hell freezes over and then they will fight it on the ice. Um, so that's like, that's what you're up against. <laughs> um, and, and you it might think, um, you, you know, oh, well, well here, you know, the Falcon pipeline or a project in the US, maybe it's, it's not of that skill, but it is. I mean, you just haven't hit the right nerve yet to elicit that response, but that's what's waiting um, on the other end. And so, um, so it, it's such an important thing. And, and what's really happening also is, is like a psychological operation, right? To build a code and to say that if you go against this code, you're not part of us anymore. Um, and, and even, you know, to hear Jesse talk and, 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 and have a, like a revelation, like, but there's another code and, and that code's important too, an environmental code or a moral code. Um, and and, but, but there's a lot building against someone having the revelation that there's a different code. Um, and so I'll just end it on like something that I think is such an important part of this picture. And unfortunately in the US, we really don't have this right now, but that's regulators who are willing to also go against that code. Uh, and by that code, I mean like the, the corporate code, the code that allows this violence and this harm to happen. Um, and it's just, what's so shocking to me is that they are very complicit in this and they might not be, you know, holding the gun to the head. They might not be, you know, the one um, pouring the toxic waste into the stream, but they're allowing it to happen. And it doesn't have to be that way. And constantly in my reporting, I'm given this response from regulators that um, they're kind of just following along. They're understaffed. They don't have a, a, enough money. Um, but I have also, and I don't buy that. I'm sorry, because, because they can be, they can blow the whistle on this too. And I've seen, and I've encountered regulators who have done that and, and it's, and they're literally saving lives when they do. And they've lost their jobs just as, you know, someone working in the industry has, but, um, but the ripples they create are astounding. And, you know, I think 
like there should be more people <laughs> as we try and you know raise new generations saying like I want to grow up to be the head of Ohio's air permitting division I mean that's like that job can be so powerful and it's not just like some hollow bureaucratic job I mean you can help people and, and we need to inspire vibrancy in, in those folks too and, and I just they're not part of the conversation right now unfortunately oh wow so much material here I hope we can get it all in so workers need to know their rights and that is the one thing I love about unions is protection and adverse working environments unions educate their employees or their workers on those rights like receiving workplace safety and health training, uh, demonstration and education on machines, uh, PPE or personal protective equipment such as gloves or harnesses, uh, protection, protection against toxic uh, chemicals and, and, and so forth. So uh, the question to the group is how can unions protect workers and their communities? Uh, Daryl, I'm going to start with you. Um, I think the, the main way that workers and unions can protect their communities is by having, like with the oil chemical atomic workers and steel workers unions, they usually have a clause in their contract. If they see unsafe work, they can shut the shop, the, the part of the plant down. And that's the kind of protection we need to have strong unions that have good contracts, especially around health and safety for the workers, but also making that transparent to the communities around the site. Um, one bill we're working on in Louisiana this year is to get air monitoring in all the chemical plants online so people know what's going on. In one case, we were working with union members at a plant that made uh, perchloroethylene uh, for dry cleaning. And they tested the blood of these guys and the levels were off the chart. So they all brought whistleblowers against the company. And <clears throat> they were able <clears throat> to get additional health care healthcare. and uh, relief from some of the, the toxic emissions they were um, being forced upon themselves. So it's having a strong contract, a strong union, but having a strong link with the surrounding community is what's needed. Thank you. Uh, Justin, I'll go back to you on, on this. Can, how can unions protect workers and communities? Yeah, you know, it's, um, I'm, I'm not going to speak much on this, not because it's not important, but just because my reporting is often on industries um, where there are no unions. And so I really don't, um, you know, it's it's not a world that comes at me much. And unfortunately, I, I have contacted some folks in, um, in um, the Steelworkers Union, but it's not something that has a big, um, grasp on the, on the, at least the oil and gas industry that I report on. Um, but I think it's clear, I mean, the work, I am in touch with workers who have tried to unionize certain parts of the industry, such as brine trucks, um, brine haulers, drivers who are hauling um, what the industry innocently called brine, but is actually, um, you know, not just like a cooking thing, um, but a really toxic um, brew that comes up in oil and gas production filled with heavy metals, filled with radioactivity. And, and the story of the worker um, who I'm in touch with who tried to unionize their small part of this industry was an immediate shutdown. Um, mm -hmm. and, and, and then again, like Jesse alluded to, they are, they are placed on, um, you know, they're put at risk of losing their job and, and they're placed on kind of like a bad list within the industry. So I think it's it's um, it's to such a point in um, in certain sectors of the oil and gas industry that that um, 
it's almost as if you can't even dream about it. You can't even think about it. I mean, they've really done a, a good job at, at keeping it um, out, which I suppose shows you how, um, how much good could come if it really w were um, brought up. So. Um, Thank you. Thank you. Erica, you look like you have something to say right now about <laughs> the unions protecting workers and communities. Um, well, I don't really have much to add. I think just basically giving giving the workers a voice and a platform and again, trusting their experience. They know um, better than anyone what the work requires and the dangers of the work. So um, yeah, giving, giving them a voice is really powerful, not just within the oil and gas industry, but just workers in general. Thank you. Uh, Jesse, um, how can unions protect workers in the community? Well, union and non-union all have the same ability for the stop work authority. They all do the JSAs, which are the job safety analysis prior to beginning work. They're all supposed to be given or issued by the company the proper PPE to keep you safe. And you're supposed to get the proper training uh, to keep you safe and compliant on site. Now in the oil and gas sector, that's tracked by ISN Networld uh, out of the oil and gas sector being steel mills, power plants, coke facilities, stuff like that. That's tracked through OSHA where you're required to get a OSHA 10 or OSHA 30, depending on what you're doing. So how do you keep it, keep someone safe? How do you keep a worker safe? You get a proper safety man, not just a fake guy, you know, not just someone that comes in and throws on the safety shirt and says, hey, I'm the safety man. And now he's under the thumb of the ops manager or the general manager, whoever's in charge, who's also receiving pressure from up above. He becomes a puppet is what the safety man does. So if you get a legit safety man, someone that's trained externally, not from any standard school, but has to go through some stringent training. If you get someone, I mean, how do you have a babysitter with no credentials? You know, you, I'm not just going to hire a 16 year old because they're 16 and in the window of looking like a babysitter to come in here and watch my kids. So if you're overseeing workers and their lives are in your hands, you really need to be trained. So it starts with the safety man. And once that safety man actually cares about his job and cares about keeping the people safe and cares about getting the proper PPE and fights for the budget so that they can get the proper Tyvek suits and the proper respirators and the proper gloves and all that proper PPE. And he fights for the worker because he knows that he's gonna be in, inhaling you know, all this nasty stuff that's gonna give him cancer in 10 years that that guy doesn't deserve when he's just trying to support his family. Or he's gonna be exposed to chemicals that are gonna give him skin burns. I've gone through hell and back, at, you know, working. I used to work at steel mills, power plants, coke facilities, all that, because I used to do mill writing and conveyor belt work prior to joining the oil and gas industry. So I'm pretty mm -hmm. multifaceted in this. And I've literally seen it all. You know, what Daryl was talking about, I'm familiar with those steel plants. And uh, they'll tell you that, yeah, you have the rights to stop everything. I've never seen it done. Ever, never. I've, I've seen a guy smashed with a coil down in AK Steel, Middletown, Ohio, and the whole plant still didn't shut down. And that guy was dead on impact. The plant still did not shut down. So their stop work authority is just like me saying whatever I want just to make you happy. I'm, I'm not going to yeah. do that. I'm going to tell you the truth. For unions to get and you know safe workers, you have to have a properly trained safety man. That's where it starts. Okay, thank you, uh, Chrissy. Um, what what is uh, what would you say about how unions can protect com workers and communities? Um, I would like to see our unions holding our electeds accountable more, um, rather than just like pandering to them. Um, we worked really hard, I mean, particularly Georgia being a big example, we worked really hard as a movement um, to elect Democrats 
um, you know, with promise with certain promises. And I want people to understand that um, it would indeed be worse uh, if fascism, the way that it was currently rolling, uh, were allowed to continue growing. Um, but that doesn't mean that what we have now is better than we've ever had before. It, because it's not, and that would be a lie and we would be gaslighting ourselves thinking that what we have now is better than um, the past. So I would really love for our, um, for our unions to, to push back. And, you know, I like to say that people, that electeds need to be responsible to us as a movement, but we haven't made them, we haven't forced them to be accountable um, to do so. I also really appreciate, um, unions like Unite Here that are led by, um, by uh, people of color who are in low wage uh, industries, who are in um, industries that are historically, um, that historically have many loopholes. I'm thinking about farm workers and the coalition of Immokalee workers. I'm thinking about um, domestic workers, any tipped employee, um, I'm, I really appreciate unions who are supporting and speaking out. Um, and in addition, uh, worker centers, you know, as sort of a union for those who are not um, already represented by one, um, particularly undocumented folks. I think we need to get out of um, accepting sweetheart deals um, where uh, unions come in and fight for um you know, lesser conditions um, to pacify workers. Um, there's, there's a lot that can be done and sadly not enough time to, to go through all of it in my opinion. Yes, I know. And since there's not a whole lot of time left because I've really like enjoyed all of you, um, maybe we can ask, uh, invite three participants to ask questions of the panelists. Um, would you kind of like raise your hand up or does anybody have, or you can put it into the chat. Yeah, we have um, two already. We have Chris and Brent, I believe. Okay, uh, Chris, will you unmute yourself and ask your question? Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Um, thank you for everything. Um, uh, I am also a, uh, suffocated whistleblower. <laughs> I did the non-disclosure. I understand what you're going through. Um, my question is, I uh, fight Mariner East, right? And so I'm daily out there as a watchdog in my community. I have actually realized that when we have elected Democrats into office, we've turned our, uh, our community over to from Republican red over 150 years and now to blue wave, which bugs the hell out of me because the blue wave has done nothing. Um, because the unions have actually subjugated them. And what they tried to do is create this dialogue and say that we're trying to take their jobs away. And so the only thing I'm fighting as a scientist, by the way, I'm a scientist. Um, I educate my community. I'm a water protector. I'm here because um, I'm also from Philadelphia and I am a union family. Like my family grew up in union. I came from like blue collar. What bugs me is that these people work hard and they get hurt every day and nobody's telling them what they're going through. And so the union's job is to be honest. And when I see union people fighting people who are trying to say the truth, it really bugs the hell out of me. I don't know how I can help when I go to sites because I watch dog every day and watch workers who are pouring like bentonite and things that are actually MSDS like saying that's an, an inhalation risk and these young people are not wearing respirators. And when I got a whistleblower, they told me, oh, it's like a guy wears a respirator in a very population dense area where they're in the backyard. That he looks like a, um, excuse my language. I am so sorry for this language, but he, I, this is quoting, you're a pussy. Because they actually, tell that guy not to wear it because they don't want us who are actually watching them to see a respirator so Chris, on their face. So Chris, what's your question for the My group? question is how as union people, like 
when these guys go on site and they're union workers, which Justin deals with fracking wells, why he couldn't speak to it. But in the pipeline world, we're controlled by unions. That is exactly why fracking is allowed because we are, they fight this fight through us, the population dense area with voting capabilities. And they are being told that don't wear protective equipment. And if we call OSHA because they have to be the ones that report an OSHA violation, right? We got, like, we literally got um, told we can't report OSHA violations when we work. These young kids are, like, breathing things in, which is also in people's backyard. How do I help you? Um, how do I help workers by not, like, I don't want to combat them. I try to tell them I'm with you. Your people aren't telling you how to help you. Like, you're being, put, I don't want to see young folks, like, these, how do I help, how do I help you? Like, how do I help those people and those union leaders talk to these young people who they're not on scene all the time? And I'm watching this. Okay. Um, does anybody want to take that question? Uh, I will tell you from my perspective, because I am, a, uh, I'm certified as an occupational uh, health nurse specialist. And what I have done in the past is to educate them on uh, the proper wearing of personal protective equipment. Unfortunately, it is a barrier that you have to do a lot of, of um, building of relationships so that they believe the words that you're saying, Chris. And um, whether, you know, it's union or non-union, uh, putting, doing letters to the editor about what you've been seeing may be one way of doing it. Just it's having casual conversations watch. may help. But uh, un until you've, you've bridged that gap, that barrier, um, you are going to have a fight ahead. Does anybody else want to answer that question? Talk to you all Daryl, Daryl. Yeah, um, uh, you know, another part of the problem is um, toxic masculinity. You know, we have to prove we're tough guys when we're working at these sites. And, you know, that's part of what we have to do is try and educate folks that being uh, a tough guy means you might die in 10 years of cancer because you're breathing this stuff without protective gear. And we have to break through that, you know, macho type thing that I got over a long time ago. But uh, some of the young guys, it's just really tough because society just, you know, wants to see somebody manly. And uh, so manly doesn't wear a uh, mask or respirators. So it's tough to break, but you know, we're, we're Sir, okay. you get what I'm saying? And I am an yeah. occupational health, I was a chemist that worked for the um, DOD as occupational health, ma'am. And so that's what I'm trying to say. I don't know how to speak to people when I am the activist and they look at me and the industry tells them not to look at me. And they have literally told them not to follow me or listen to me. I have been banned. So they try to make me the enemy and they control it. And what I do is go out there in weird like eagle costumes to make them laugh and try to get oxytocin in their head so they see me differently. Um, I'm trying to get them to listen. Because I, I totally agree with you. It is a toxic masculinity issue. And I care about their lives. They're my community. Whether they are a worker or not, they are part of my community. My community is holistic, right? right? So thank you, sir. Uh, given, given how long this is, um, this has continued. I think at this point, I am going to turn it over to Mary for the uh, other part at, of the program, as well as closure. So thank you, Mary. You're muted, Mary. Really quickly to um, Chris's question, I wanted to, I want to say, you know, yes, that's going to happen. Yes, we are going to be beaten down and discredited. Um, it's really important for us to find belonging and community with each other. 
um, when, and when we find it to, to invest in it and to hold on to it. Um, and I also, I also want to say that um, it's only our responsibility to influence what it is that we can touch. Octavia Butler, you know, science fiction. I was not a science fiction fan when I was a little kid, but it has um, helped transform um, the way that I vision uh, as an adult. And I so appreciate Octavia Butler. And she has a quote that says, everything you touch, you change and everything you change changes you. And so it's really important um, to not get overwhelmed, even though that is obviously much easier said than done. I certainly am overwhelmed and I will tell you why. And um, yes, it is brave of me to say this, but it also, it also hurts me to not say it, to not admit it and to live in silence hurts me. It physically hurts me, but I have survived de being detained. I have survived being strip searched. I have survived being assaulted. I have survived death threats for this work. And that makes me feel scared, but it also makes me feel an outsized responsibility that when I feel that way, I realize I've started to realize, you know, thank God for healing and goddess and, you know, all that is divine in nature. I thank, I thank all of creation for reminding me that if I think it's all my responsibility, that um, that's ego driven. And if it's, it's our collective responsibility. So we can only, we can only be responsible for what it is that we are actually able to steward, right? And there's all sorts of psychologists that say, you can only act adequately manage 150 relationships at any one given time, right? So think about how you spend your time and where you prioritize your energy and do take responsibility for the ways that you are privileged to pull pri other privileged people along in understanding what how big these problems are and how interconnected they are because without that cross-sectionality, we're not gonna win, right? I hope that's helpful. Um, and also Miriam Kaba um, says that hope is a discipline. So that means it's a practice. And my indigenous friends and family in Colombia have taught me that hope is a duty. So it's easier said than done, but I do hope that that is just a moment of hope. Thank you, Chrissy, for just rounding that out and, and naming those those other things that we have to lean on each other and not think that it's um, just our responsibility to, to do all this work that we have to, to work together. So thank you. All right, so I'm um, gonna share our screen as we as we close out. Um, we knew we had a lot to, to share. This is probably more like a two event um, program with, that we should have, um, you know, we just have so much to share about this, this topic, but um, we're gonna share some of the things that are going on as well um, that, that connect. Of course, we have this, um, the, the OVEC, amazing workers at OVEC, um, they're having their board meeting tonight. Um, we're sh we'll share the link to these slides, um, and we'd like you to to support them and their their effort to to unionize. Um, and then we have uh, the anti protest bills that we we spoke of. We know there's here in Ohio. There's four of them. TV. Um, and then in Kentucky, there's one as well. Um, I didn't. I looked up some. Um, in Pennsylvania, West Virginia, I didn't see any um, actively um, being pursued, but if anybody knows about that, um, they can put that in the, in the chat. Um, then we have, um, we're going on Diane Wilson, who's a A to Z alum. She's down uh, trying to protect the 
the dredging um, of the bay, uh, I heard a, um, a podcast of, of hers that where she talked about how the, the plastic nurdles that are, are dumped into the waters, they act like sponges and they, they absorb the mercury. And now they're trying to dredge. And so it's gonna stir up all those nurdles and just create a, a disaster down there. So she's on a hun hunger strike. Um, so you can support her, there's information there. And then we have a report by um, the Ohio River Valley Institute um, about how there's, you know, millions of, of um, abandoned mines and how that could provide some, some jobs um, for, for our communities um, to actually right some of the wrongs. I mean, it's crazy that we have to actually do that, but um, at least it, it can, can help our communities um, repair some of the damage. And, and provide some jobs. Um, then we have Save the Date. Our, our next uh, event is uh, students taking on petrochemicals on May 17th. And there's a registration link and they are also having a, a youth conference for ages 15 to 24. We want to share that with you. And that's, that's about it. And then anybody that wants to stick around, we can um, go into a little bit more discussion. Yeah, so I can interject here um, just to pass it over to Ryan. So for folks who are still with us, um, one of the things we love to do at A to Z is just have some time to network and connect with one another. I know we're past time and a lot of folks have had to go, but if you're interested in sticking around, um, we're going to hold space for about five minutes to pair folks off into some breakout rooms just to do a bit of networking and discuss what you learned and share anything that you'd like to speak to on this topic. And then we can come back as a big group. Um, and if we have more time for Q&A or if we want to just close things out, we can do that as well. Awesome. Thanks, Kelsey. So. Um, I'll invite everybody uh, to go into breakouts. And also before anyone who has to leave right now, make sure to stay connected with us in the A to Z discussion over in the campaign network. And so I just put the link in the chat and um, you can create a profile and you can find other people here and, and leave comments and continue the discussion. All right, so we are opening the rooms and we'll just um, have fun uh, 